Hi everyone, um, here is with me David uh, Google, Professor of uh, Chemical Engineering from um, University College London. Hi David, um, happy to have you um, in our platform, um, the leadership, how to get leadership platform, uh, Leading Voices. Mm -hmm. Great pleasure to be here. So, the first question I'm going to ask you, um, Jack Google, the founder of One Word Group, a relative or coincidence family uh, name? Uh, it's a, it's a um, uh, relatively rare name, so it must be a relative, but that one I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'll be a cousin somewhere along the line. It's a relatively, um, uh, as I say, relatively rare name from Scotland uh, originally, and there are some around the world, but. I don't know that one. <laughs> right. I mean, that means um, so this person comes from Italian, uh, from oh. Verona, okay. that place. So, mm. yeah. So, David, your career path is very inspiring and interesting to many. Mm -hmm. uh, Would you like to tell us about it? Okay. So, um, uh, from the beginning, so uh, actually, I was born and brought up in Australia. <coughs> And uh, for various reasons, my family came to live in England, and I studied chemical engineering at um, Imperial College London <coughs> um, because I was always interested in science and things, and I thought engineering would be more practical. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I decided to do a PhD in this rather small, rather sp specialised area. It's a very mathematical end of chemical engineering. Process systems engineering. I found that quite inspiring, whereas, to be honest, quite a lot of the course didn't inspire me. <laughs> so then, um, after the PhD, I, I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do, um, whether I wanted to be an academic career or not, or, and I thought, well, let's go into um, industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I applied for a number of jobs, and I got offered a few, and I saw this rather interesting job in a very large company. Uh, in the research station um, and in the British Gas Corporation, as it was, it was called, and uh, it was, I think it was definitely the right decision for me at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was in there, I tried to make the most of, I tried to really make contacts. I was in technically in a research station, but as an engineer, you still want to get out there and do things. So I made connections, and I think in my longer term career, that really helped me, um, give me. Uh, confidence and sort of credibility. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after a few years, it, it did get a bit frustrating because it was difficult. Such a big organisation, getting things... I had some very interesting... a couple of very interesting projects. One very interesting one which took me to Japan for a month <coughs> on a technology exchange. But it, it, they couldn't decide in the corporation whether they were really going to go for it or, or not. And I just found that rather frustrating. So after about three years, I thought, well, maybe I'll think about an academic career and um, or an academic job. And then this, there was a job in Australia, and I was thinking about Australia, mm. and um, because I have an Australian passport, and um, mm. but I lived away for a long time. And then I thought, well, why not? So I applied for a job, and I got it, and it was at the University of Adelaide. And it was, it was again, it was a sort of time when you can take a risk, actually. I was quite worried about it at the time. I remember I got quite distressed. Should I? Shouldn't I? It's a long way away. Uh, you know, even though I grew up there, it was a city I knew nobody. But in the end, I thought, why not? So off I went. And um, it was great. I really, but very quickly, I realised I didn't want to stay there because um, it feels very isolated. So um, I. Um, did some interesting research, I learned a lot of mistakes on, on how not to teach. <laughs> and then I happened to be passing through London and I was giving a seminar at UCL and it just happened that they were interviewing and I said, oh, I might be interested in that. And so I was interviewed for the post and then I got the job at UCL. Um, UCL had chemical engineering a long time, certainly by British standards. Uh, I think it's the oldest university chair in chemical engineering. Um, but what I really liked about UCL, which I much preferred to Imperial College, is the cross-disciplinary nature. Mm -hmm. It's got, um, we have all disciplines uh, except religion. It <laughs> uh, goes right back to the founding. Mm -hmm. So in my career as a researcher, 
I have worked with many science disciplines and, and more recently more with um, um, medical disciplines. So I'm a systems engineer, look at large complex manufacturing systems um, uh, with pharma here in, uh, pharma in Switzerland, with pharma in the US, with chemical companies in the UK and big oil and all these sorts of things. And, um, and then um, uh, in the last 10 years, I started to look at medicine or physiology as, a, as an engineering problem. So looking at the systems engineering of the liver and the liver system. So we do predictive models. And, uh, and that's, so I've um, uh, also been involved, I, I like teaching. I'm involved in a number of teaching initiatives. A number of teaching initiatives looking at different ways of teamwork and project management in particular in the 90s. I got lots of industrial money for this. So for me, the nice thing about being an academic is the teaching and research balance. And uh, I also felt that one of the frustrations at British Gas was I always had to just work for one set of problems. Whereas a, as an academic, I can choose my partners. <laughs> and I've worked, as I say, with pharma, with oil with um, these clinical areas and it just sort of allows me to do that provided I deliver uh, and of course 10 years ago I took on the role of a much more sort of senior role as um, pro vice provost of the doctoral school so I oversee all of our early career researchers across all disciplines so that's um, in um, so we have about 6,000 research students and about 3,500 postdocs uh, and uh, that's just a sort of natural development of my career in a sense because all the time while I've been at UCL I've been making links across the institution and getting involved in central activities as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a quick, very yeah, interesting. <laughs> but actually you probably answered quite a few yeah, Sorry. <laughs> well you can keep answering the questions and I can flesh it out a bit. No, no, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Would you like to tell us about the, your role in um, doctoral, doctoral schools? Okay. School. Yeah, so it's, the role is overseeing, as I say, all of the early career researchers. <coughs> uh, and I'm the most sort of senior academic for that role. Obviously, I am within I'm with the vice director of research, well, it's Provost Research, it's called, mm -hmm. um, and I work directly for him. But um, it's, it's good to have an academic champion of, early, of the researchers rather than just the research. So it, I would say it has three things about it. It's a uh, strategy for the institution. So we have a doctoral education strategy and now an early career research strategy that fits within the overall strategies of, of the institution. Strategy, standards, mm -hmm. particularly of doctoral degrees. And we have regulatory committees and I chair those. And that involves also training, training of staff, training of students, supervisor training, that sort of stuff. And support beyond the discipline. So it's trying to get researchers out of their narrow disciplines to cross disciplines but also think about their career and their skills and their skills to skills as well. Now I don't, uh, it's a, we're a very small team so I don't do that individually but I'm, a, if you like, the sort of ultimate client. I'm looking for all of the service areas have to demonstrate to me that they're delivering according to a, a strategy and likewise the faculty, so we have 11 faculty, so I get a, a faculty doctoral strategy each year, a sort of rolling one saying, how are you doing, uh, this is what your statistics look like, where are you going, and then we challenge them a bit on that to make sure that they're doing as best as they can. Is that quick? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. So, uh, because, because you've been involved like, in, in industry as well, and you know, like many industrial and governmental projects, what are the biggest challenges in the field um, that the industry or the academy, even academic research, is facing nowadays? And how, how to think, how to how to uh, solve these mm -hmm. challenges? Big question, of course. Um, so we um, uh, biggest challenges, <coughs> I think, uh, I think information challenges huge amounts of information. How do we manage that information? How do we decide what is the most appropriate information to make that decision in a rational and transparent way? <clears throat> so that might be about the environment, it might be about 
it might, it might be about functioning uh, health care in many cases. <coughs> but we have huge amounts of information, uh, but we also have a lot of understanding. So there's a, a strange dichotomy going on at the moment. In, I see it especially in biology, <coughs> where there's a bioinformatics community, and there's what they call an ab initio committee, which is uh, trying to predict on the basis of physics and chemistry principles. And somehow it doesn't sort of meet in the middle very well, because the bioinformatics people just look at data patterns. Uh, and, and actually we need both of these things. We need how do we best use the data and how do we best use our understanding of the natural world and our ability to predict that. And that's also to some extent true in, in the industry where they've got huge amounts of data coming in. Um, we can predict some things but some things not very well. How do we balance those two together and predict in a very uncertain world, uncertain politically, uncertain financially uncertain in a, um, in a um, uh, um, uh, yes, what is it? politics, environment and finance. These are all very uncertain and we have to be able to manage it. So how do we tackle it? Well, we tackle it by chipping away at it. We have a lot of methodologies already with engineering and its sort of strap line is engineering the heart of society because engineers are about solving problems, but not just solving problems for their own sake, it's solving problems because society wants us to solve them. And we really need to build those things. Mm -hmm. There you go. So there's no single bullet, but I think we research chips away and we try and innovate more that's why, um, to bring in research ideas. That's why I think researchers are so important in this, in this context, in this world that we're bringing in ideas to tackle these grand challenges, not just with our own ideas, but innovating with other people's ideas as well. We, we're, that's what researchers should be doing. Perfect. Um, just, it's, it's a huge, heavier path <laughs> that you've been like, you know, developing and already developed. Uh, what basically motivates you to, to succeed? It's, you know, it's interesting to know the story behind. As an academic, it was uh, obviously a, an interest in the subject, a commitment to the subject. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, you know, if, um, I think as an academic, teaching is probably the most satisfying part of it. Because uh, you're, and, and actually, to me, the, most, the best part actually has always been training doctoral candidates, actually. Probably even more than than teaching undergraduates. But teaching is about developing people and seeing people grow and develop. <laughs> and that to me is the most exciting thing of all. Research is interesting and challenging problems and I can write papers but some of them will be taken up and some of them won't and so on. But all of those people are really growing and developing and it's really exciting to see them grow and develop. And especially this very intimate relationship one has with Dr. Candidates. And that was why the um, when I was um, uh, applied for the doctor school, it's called the graduate school, you know, it's, it's basically the same thing, uh, 10 years ago. It was such a natural development of what I do anyway, that it was the thing that I find most satisfying, is training doctor students. And so the growth and development and well-being of researchers is, that's to me now the most exciting thing, actually. I do I still do a bit of research, not so much, but is trying to get the best for our researchers who are so um, uh, smart and uh, motivated. But it's quite a challenge. I think it's a more challenging world for early career researchers than it was when I was young. Um, <clears throat> okay, I took a slightly different path anyway by going to industry, so I bypassed the postdoc phase completely. I sort of did an industrial postdoc, let's say, but it was a permanent position, so I could have stayed there forever. But, uh, but to me, if we can make that better, uh, and I think researchers deserve it, that is very motivating to me at the moment, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. It really wants to get me out of bed in the morning, and it will take, probably see, see me through to retirement. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, you said the commitment, the word commitment, and mm -hmm. it has to be lovable. Hard work as well behind behind the scene. Um, so, 
it's interesting for me to know and, uh, that that ha what do you do to uh, basically to, to relax out of work? Okay, so it is a great commitment, but you have to remember if there was one message I wanted to get to your audience, you need life outside work. We all need life outside work. There will be ups and downs. I can tell you about some tough times in my own career when um, I really needed the rest of my life. <laughs> um, and so I haven't I work hard, but I don't work ridiculously hard. You know, some of these stories of you know, huge amounts. Of, uh, I suppose it was a time in my life when I worked pretty hard, on it, but not some of the numbers that they barely around now. So what I do, um, so I play the violin. <laughs> and I have played the violin since I was a child. Uh, and it's a very important part of my life and my family's life. So my, um, my wife died a few years ago, about three years ago. And she was also, she was a lawyer but also played the viola. And so we used to do a lot of music things together. And my daughter, uh, plays the cello and the piano. So music was a very important part of our, our life. Not just playing, but it's a, it's your whole social life. Um, uh, and it means that if the, the world of academia or industry or whatever it might be gets on top of you, there's a whole extra world that you can go out and talk to. Now everybody must have some enthusiasm like that. I do a bit of sport, I've got a friend, I don't really do sport, I cycle occasionally and, um, and I read and um, um, I see friends and all of those sorts of things, but it's the music that's the, that whole world that I can just put engineering and research and teaching and everything completely to one side and immerse myself in playing or perhaps just going to a concert or getting to the musical friends to do the things we do. Indeed, it, it, it's very important, I guess, you, you probably propose and suggest things uh, to have, like, you know, beside the professional thing, something to... It's, um, I can't emphasize how important I is. Yeah. You know, the people who get stuck on... The, and I see this not just with early career researchers, I see it with senior colleagues as well. Stuck and stuck and stuck and stuck and stuck, stuck, stuck and then they've sort of excised the rest of the life because they're so focused on this one thing and then something goes wrong and you hit a really tough patch professionally or personally or whatever and you, you've got nowhere to turn to and, uh, and it's so important that researchers at all levels really keep up their networks, their social networks as well as their professional networks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at the end, uh, is there anything else that you would like to, to add um, for our, as, as a leading voice? <laughs> I guess, well, the, the message of networks is, is crucial, but the other is think about where you're going. Think about what you want to do. Keep your eyes open. Um, lots of researchers um, uh, thinking about academic careers all the time. Um, we know that many don't go into academic careers, but you mustn't see that in any way as um, uh, a disappointment, because there are so many different careers out there that you have to find what's right for you. So you need to find out what you want out of life and what you want out of a career. And have the talk to people, have discussions, uh, so that when you come to make choices, you're making informed choices, not because somebody thought that was the best way for you, or because you thought that was the best way, but you hadn't really looked around to see what other things are. As I said, I went into industry. I didn't. I, I, it's not to say one will know what one wants to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do at the age of 25, 26 when I finished my PhD. But I tried various different things. <laughs> and in the end, I remember I went, uh, when I took the job in Australia, it, I was thinking it was a sort of three-way experiment. It was, did I like Australia? Did I like living in a city that wasn't the size of London? And did I like being an academic? Well, 
that was one out of three I got right. But uh, because, but you know, try, experiment, talk, but don't close the options. Um, keep as many options open as, as possible, and really think about it, uh, and think about oneself, and, and tr try and move towards. I mean, one has to make some some sorts of decisions. But one doesn't have to make, um, uh, well, no decision is permanent. Mm. That's the other thing. <laughs> you know, you get yourself into a corner uh, that you don't want, then change it. Mm. <laughs> because particularly, I think we're talking to researchers here now, very resourceful, very intelligent, sometimes too narrow in our focus. That is perhaps our biggest weakness. So it's important that we work on our weaknesses as well as our strengths. Try and keep and look around, look at all the options, all the possible things that go around there, and go for it. Take the ah, but that's another thing. Take the opportunity. I tell you, all of my jobs came out of the blue. I think the um, British Gas job. I just happened to see in the paper the UCL job, the this Adelaide job. I just happened to see. I didn't go searching for it. I just happened. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Um, the UCL job was, as I say, I have to be passing through and they have to be advertising, uh, interviewing. And the graduate school job, I remember I got a call from the head of the, then head of the graduate school, my predecessor, saying, did I want to be a vice head? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And at the time, I was very dissatisfied with various things and I thought, actually, that would be an interesting thing to do. Let me have a go at that. And so, and then, then I became a sort of vice head and then when she went to New York, I, so, keep open-minded. Open-minded, open eyes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Thank I you for your time. It. I appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs>